Welcome to the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast, brought to you today from the Precision Metal Forming Association and the PMA's Educational Foundation. We appreciate their support. Today we have with us Alyssa Wild. Hello, Alyssa. Hi, thanks for having me. Alyssa comes to us from Stratasys, and uh, we're glad to have her today on the show. Uh, she she brings to us a, uh, a interesting perspective since she is the senior technical manager for Stratasys for the factory floor solutions team. We do appreciate her taking time out of her busy schedule to be here today. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company, Stratasys? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I'm a materials engineer by trade. Um, and have spent my entire career kind of in uh, research and development, manufacturing support um, across a a really wide variety of industries, getting to touch everything from, uh, you know, plastics to to metals. Um, I joined Stratasys about five years ago, just over five years ago. Uh, And the the team I lead here now is focused on manufacturing tooling and how we can kind of bring additives uh, onto the factory floor. Excellent. Excellent. Since you've been there, uh, let me let me instead of just looking forward the five years, let's look a little bit back on on your history. What would you say are uh, one of the greatest accomplishments you've had since you've been there? Uh, yeah, so I've had an interesting career at Stratasys holding you know multiple positions. I actually started here in the materials development group. Um, so some of the, the fun projects I had there, the commercial uh, material we sell now is ASA was one of the materials I released to market, um, which was a you know great accomplishment. And then I've had some very fun uh, feasibility uh, studies and that kind of stuff. So it's great to see materials that I've developed uh, over the years kind of come to market and really kind of take a take a place in 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 additive has been um it has been great excellent excellent i'm sure that's been pretty exciting for you i know new materials are always appreciated because it, it takes the technology in a new direction and opens up all new kinds of doors and really opens up people's ideas to the technology so that's fantastic uh Tell me a little bit about what you think five years from now uh, we had on, uh, before we had on Scott from Stratasys earlier, but as you go forward, you're kind of challenged with executing kind of the Stratasys' five-year plan. What what things do you think that you're going to have to do in order to accomplish some of those goals? Yeah, so the the plans we create uh, for me and my team are definitely um, built off the knowledge and expertise that, you know, everyone from me and my team has being, you know, from the manufacturing industry in a, you know, variety of position, Uh, everybody from tooling designers to manufacturing engineers. Um, So we take that, you know, relevant industry experience along with Uh, meeting with customers and taking that strong voice of customer into the products and uh, materials we develop, right? So uh, being that we're geared towards factory floor solutions, we really try to focus on what will help people create tooling that is relevant and and meaningful to the manufacturing floor. Um, So how can we take the systems and materials that we have and, you know, really teach people how to convert metal tooling to plastic tooling, where does it fit, um, and finding all those, um, so really that's the goal that my team has, um, and it's, it's a tough goal, but it's um, a great challenge to be able to take the knowledge we have and really focus and formulate new plans on how to uh, make that shift from um, metal to plastic. Yeah, uh, and, and it is, it, it's really creating uh, a mindset that people understand that that's an opportunity. Do, Correct. Yeah. Do you uh, do you see manufacturers uh, embracing the technology more in five years, and and how do you see them changing the way that they look at additive and the opportunities that you have with with the products? 
Yeah, definitely. So when we go to a, you know many manufacturers, right? So we step in the in the tool shop and and talk with the tooling designers and tooling engineers, and it really does take a shift in mindset to get people comfortable with the thought that their traditional heavy you know metal tooling that served a purpose can really be changed to plastic, and that's um, you know to get people comfortable with that around the design guidelines and the, the characteristics and the technology shift um, is really what we focus on is how to. Um, get that shift in mindset to really make people comfortable with that plastic tooling has a fit on the factory floor, um, that it lasts and that it's durable and that it meets the requirements that uh, manufacturers need today. So it's really helping us um, uh, see the limitations, right? There's places it fit and places it doesn't. So helping people kind of define that roadmap and that plan for their, you know, different manufacturing industries to really find the place and help them uh, embrace that technology. Great. It, it, I think that people have to look outside of just thinking in terms of the way tooling is right now and look at what it can be. And, and that's a challenge, I think, as you mentioned, that that's something that you, you not only have to allow them the opportunity to embrace it, but you also have to have them kind of trained in a different way to where they don't just uh, look at it, it has to be metal and that's all. And uh, I, I know companies like Boeing and, and, and other companies like that, they even, at, when they design planes now, they've looked to other technologies and other engineers outside of aerospace to try and bring in unique ideas because if you just always look to the same people, look to the same technology, then you can try and refine your process and improve that process. But you may not, you may be overlooking some other opportunities that you never even thought were there. So I think you've done a great job with uh, uh, speaking to the, the challenges that you guys are faced with. What, what are some of the challenges that you think you're going to be faced with to achieve your goals over this five year year period? Yeah, we see you know stuff like the digital factory and kind of you know heavy automation really being a a great challenge and yet a great opportunity, right? So there's with a with automation comes an increase in tooling, um, you know, end of arm tooling and and you know packaging and trays and that kind of stuff. So we definitely see that as a a, a big challenge, um, and it's definitely something that we need to plan for and train and, and really investigate to make sure that the technology that we're coming to market with five years from now in our plan will meet the needs of the customer be able to kind of predict and, and see the shift in technology and how is that going to affect our, you know, what materials and what system changes we need to make to really have additive fit and play in those new spaces. Right. Have you found that uh, in, in your research and, and actually working with the materials, have you found that you've had to do more research in things like lubrications and how they interact, how the materials you're using interact with that? Uh, especially if you talk about tooling, uh, lubricants always been such a huge part of how people produce their parts. So have you had to do more research in that direction? Uh, yeah, definitely. So being a materials engineer, I usually have the advantage when people start to talk of, you know, chemical compatibility and stuff. So it's definitely something we have in our plans to really Again, as part of that, making people comfortable, right? Everybody knows, you know, machine Delrin or Acetel or Palm, whatever you want to call it. People know how that behaves and acts on the manufacturing floor. So what we need to do is get people in that same level of comfort that the different materials that, you know, Stratasys has to offer for, for tooling can, uh, you know, perform at the same level, if not better in a lot of cases, um, than traditional machine plastics or metals for that matter. So just, you know, again, getting the data behind it and being able to um, really create the right, um, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of characteristics around a material to make sure that it's the right material for the right application. Because it's definitely the, 
I see that as a key. If you pick the, the wrong, you know, printer or the wrong material for a tooling application, it can really leave a bad taste in your mouth, uh, you know, or a, that you don't think that there's a, a feasibility for it. So if you pick the right system and the right material, you know, the successes can be endless, but it really does take knowing, you know, what's your application, what's your temperature, what, what are the chemicals it's going to be exposed to to make sure that you pick a solution that's going to be robust, um, a robust solution. Right. The, uh, when, when, you, when you talk about solutions, I think most companies are looking for solutions as opposed to just products. They, they, nowadays, companies don't seem like they, they don't want to come to you and buy your product. They want, they're coming to you because you can provide a solution to something that they're, they're challenged with. Do you, do you see that continuing here over the next five years that uh, solution-based uh, options are, are the way that, that you're going to have to approach things? Yeah, definitely. So as Scott mentioned in, in his talk that um, we see that, you know, the need of uh, from my team being the technical side is to really try to create guidelines and design guides and technical information to really create a holistic solution, not here's your material, here's your system, print your tools, but stuff that really, so we just released uh, this year some thermoforming design guide. Uh, so it really walks people through the application. How do you design? How do you print? What do you have to change? What advantages, you know, do you have as, you know, injection molding and every other um, plastic processing or metal processing has design guides and limitations? We have to define those same things for, for additive technologies to really create a, a full solution for a customer that they feel comfortable. All right, if I'm going to do um, a metal forming tool, here's the material I should pick. Here's the angles I can, you know, here's the thicknesses of the alloys I can form to this um, for each of the different types of technologies to really give people that recipe so they have the confidence to go out and design uh, tooling with additive themselves. Does that also take some level of historical information to where you are creating almost a matrix of information so that customers, okay, if you're trying to do this, here's a starting point of where you can start when you're trying to manufacture this part or you're trying to build this for a tool. Tooling is, has always been challenged with one aspect, which is when you're making the part, that's not what you're actually doing. It, you, you're making the part, but it's part of, that's being used to manufacture something else and whether or mm -hmm. not whether yeah and whether you do it correctly or not is only relevant to the point that it has to still manufacture the same part when you're punching something out or when you're uh you're you're using that to produce uh, a plastic or something else is is that more challenging right. for you so, I mean, part of that, again, comes to that shift in mindset or the, the learning the design rules and criteria around additive, right? So, with hydroforming tools and that kind of stuff. So, how can you consolidate? What are your different, um, you know, how does each different material act, right? Like, so some materials are better because they, you know, have different, you know, the surface finish, right? So, how do they interact when they, during the stamping process? Um, so, some of it is using traditional um, historical information. Some of it has been our own trial and error and success and failures in the in the positions we've held at other companies. Um, but it does take a, a variety of learnings um, to really help create those guidelines. But a lot of it is um, just trying to create something that people feel comfortable. So maybe the the final way to get to that part is to to print the tool or print the part directly, right? Maybe it doesn't need to be metal, or maybe you only need one or two. So it's kind of a combination of looking at the application or the product you're trying to create with a, a very open mindset to, to really determine the best path to get there. Um, you know, can you use 
additive is your bridge tool, right? Maybe it, you know, your first couple hundred parts can be off of additive tool, but you eventually need to switch to metal tooling. And then how does your design change from those, from those two? Because it's not always a one-for-one one printed tool to machine tool. Um, so how can you take advantage of the design freedoms with additive, but yet still incorporate that into your long-term tooling? I think that's a, that's a great term of your, your design solution of how do you get there and the flexibility that mm-hmm. additive brings you. Do, do you find that you have to work with customers to, to, to open their eyes to new opportunities? Definitely. So we do a lot of factory audits and uh, factory floor walkthroughs with, with companies um, to try to show them that these are the types of tools that would fit well. These are the types of tools that won't fit well. Because I think a lot of people in their mind go for the most, maybe the most absolutely complicated tool necessary. And sometimes those work great. Sometimes those aren't a good fit. So, um, you know, me and my team and even our North America applications team really help kind of open people's eyes to when we walk a factory floor to help tell you, these are things that are going to fit well, but it really does challenge the traditional of, well, I've made it this way for, you know, the entire life of my company. Why would I switch? Um, but to, to show you that, you know, we can make that tool better, faster, lighter. We see that in a lot of automotive companies. You know, somebody has to lift a tool off the line, you know, every 27 seconds, every 37 seconds. They have to move that tool. If I can make that tool lighter and easier to use and, you know, color code it for left-handed versus right-handed and all those features that come with additive, um, it can really kind of open the, open the idea and open, you know, really shift the way they think about um, how they've done their tooling and, you know, what applications to look at. Right. Does, as far as aerospace goes and, and even automotive apl- applications, uh, weight has become such a huge issue that people look at. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does the technology allow for new uh, strength to re- strength to weight ratios to where that it's a it's a benefit to move to this type of a, a product that is not strictly metal. Right. So I take example uh, in the, one of the newest materials we released, which was a, a, a nylon 12 with carbon fiber. So it's got a 35% chopped carbon fiber uh, in a nylon 12 base resin. So that's a material that does have a strength to weight ratio, which is very similar to that of aluminum. So when you talk, to, uh, when you talk about lifting tools or tools that have to span the width of a car or drill guides that have to cover an arrow, uh, a wing structure, uh, it's definitely something that kind of changes the mindset of, well, plastic is flimsy, um, or how is that going to hold up on my, man- you know, on my floor if I'm going to use it day in and day out? So materials like that, and as we advance, I mean, they're only going to get better um, and really challenge that kind of mindset of, well, how is a plastic tool going to change my metal tool? Materials like that really do start to compete on par with traditional metal tooling because they do have the stiffness and yet they're very, very lightweight and easy to handle. I think any manufacturing engineer is going to tell you that if a tool is bulky and heavy and cumbersome, your operator is not going to use it. So the advantage we see is when we can take that tool, lighten it up, add handles, make it ergonomic, um, but yet keep that strength and stiffness that's needed for a tool, they're easily going to use it, and it's you know going to become a favorite. So I think when we have operators try stuff for the first time, their first you know is is the skeptical again is you're going to hand me a piece of plastic to do my job, and then after they use it and kind of you know feel it and see how it performs, it definitely can can open up you know a whole new world of possibilities when it, it when it is easy to use and lightweight. Yeah, I can I can certainly see that, and that it gives it gives them a, a new world of possibilities that can take them in all new directions. Do do you find mm-hmm. that do you find that uh, you have to do more research, especially being involved in aerospace, uh, that temperature plays such an important role, whereas uh, in metals, as you heat them up, they expand. Uh, that that designing new technologies with new materials can play an advantage to where you can use uh, plastic parts that 
don't have that same property, uh, but can also uh, have some advantages in, in temperature variance. Yeah, each industry and each even company within industry has a definite kind of defined pattern of how they, um, you know, store their tooling, procure their tooling, and that kind of stuff. So, the, you know, beauty we see, too, with even additive tooling that, you know, maybe this is a one-time tool or a repair tool that doesn't need to be around long-term. So you print it for the job that's needed, and then you can discard that because you're going to have the digital file for that tool, and if you need it again, you'll just rebuild it. Um, so we see that, you know, plastic has its challenges, but, you know, we have materials that are UV stable. We have materials that have high dimensional stability. Um, so it really depends upon the industry and kind of where they fall as far as qualification. But, you know, we see that, um, you know, we've had customers that use, uh, additive tooling on their floor for, for years and they're happy with it. Some people, um, use, you know, even like our polyjet technology, right, which is a digital acrylic material that they like that for the flexibility that they can use their tool for six months to a year um, and then discard it and maybe use in, and the, the fact that it is um, easy to recreate to do design changes as they see necessary, right? You can respond to your manufacturing floor by um, doing quick reprints of technology and, uh, and they find that as a big advantage. I could certainly see that being the case with companies that have very wide and varying parts that they deliver because when you have a lot of these one-offs that you have to make, the cost to store thousands and thousands of tools that are only used once a year maybe, maybe not even that, once every 10 years. Uh, and short runs, yeah. it doesn't justify it to keep it around. So that's fantastic. Uh, I, that, and that's an area that I hadn't even thought much about uh, for that technology, uh, opening a new door mm-hmm. for that. Is is there a new technology you plan to embrace in the future that will become part of your competencies? So bringing in, uh, for instance, using things like... Uh, uh, the Internet of Things, and bringing that, incorporating that into your system. Yeah, I think what we see, you know, is the, you know, the, the digital factory and kind of the Internet of Things, right? So our systems creates need to really tie into that manufacturing floor and how can we um, really use that to, to know, hey, where is my tool on the line? How many cycles has that been used, right? More predictive maintenance. Um, and stuff like that. So I think those are definitely things that um, is a great, you know, venture for for me and my team to look at is how can we do more predictive modeling to, you know, calculate tool life and and know how tools are going to perform. So I think that that's definitely something that uh, is a great, right, um, great way for us to segment into the Internet of Things and the digital factory, right? If we can put RFIDs on our tooling and you can track exactly where everything is on your floor, just like you can with other pallets and other, you know, other technologies on the manufacturing floor, I think that would be a great way for Stratasys to kind of embrace that um, future, you know, Internet of Things, digital factories and that kind of stuff to tie it all together. Right. I, I think that a lot of companies that I speak to, they're looking for more things to close the loop to where if I'm doing this, can we analyze it so that we become more predictive of when something's going to fail, when we're going to have challenges uh, and start to see deterioration. People seem to want more of that information so that they can make better decisions and not be in downtime conditions. Is that something that uh, you guys are looking at? Definitely. We, uh, line down situation is everybody's kind of worst nightmare, right? When your tool fails or when your um, products don't arrive, that's a, that's a loss of money for everybody, right? So that's definitely something that I to be able to, to guarantee and, and make people comfortable that, you know, additive tooling, uh, can play into that, and, and the fact that you can respond to the manufacturing floor faster can help that line down situation, right? It's, it's, a, it's a backup. You're not going to wait six weeks if your tool breaks uh, in the middle of a shift um, 
you know, you want to be able to get that tooling in your hands right away. So the faster you can get that, um, additive is a great time saver. So it's things like that that we try to, to really be able to, the more we can predict, the better we can start, you know, analyzing, okay, where is that tool going to be at uh, next shift? Do I need to start another print? Do I need another tool? Or how can I optimize that? So it's definitely something we look at and, uh, and think there's a great opportunity there as well. Well, great. Uh, we've been on here with Alyssa Wild from Stratasys. We want to thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Appreciate you being here today. Yeah, thank you. And uh, again, we thank our sponsors, Precision Metal Forming Association and the PMA's Educational Foundation for uh, presenting the Destiny of Manufacturing today. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.